Thanks very much, uh, Samar, and I join Samar in thanking you. It's very kind of you to come at this stage of the year. Um, we have to make a story out of numbers, and I think there are several interesting storylines to these numbers, actually, and I thank Mosaid Khan and his colleagues. Mosaid is our head of statistics, and he will be able to take you through any detailed questions that you have. But let me uh, suggest a couple of things to you. Uh, First, in general, uh, we're dealing with the year 2010, right? This is a report on what happened in the year 2010. In general, what it shows is a very strong recovery from 2009. Uh, so I think that's the first uh, very clear picture that emerges. Um, and it's a recovery that is greater than the recovery in, in or the rate of global economic growth. So you had growth rates for patents of 7.2%. Worldwide, trademarks growth rate 11.8%. Industrial designs 13%. And utility models 13%. Uh, the world economy grew by 5.1% uh, over that time. So this, this is, I think, uh, a first thing to note. Now, if we decompose some of those into patents and the trademarks, uh, let me say that in the patent field, you had a 7.2% increase uh, in filings worldwide in 2010, and 80% of that was driven by China and the United States. 80% was driven by China and the United States. So we see a strong rebound from the United States of America. They uh, grew by in 2010 by 7.5%. Uh, and China uh, grew again by an extraordinary amount. Uh, actually, it was 24.3%, 24% China in 2010. Um, what we see with China, I think, and we've been talking about this every time we meet now for quite some time, but it is again confirmed in the picture in 2010. So let me point out a couple of things to you. First, the overall growth rate of 24.3%. Uh, but secondly, if you look at the decade from 2001 to 2010, you see that China averaged a growth rate of 22.6% over the decade, every year. So in the year 2001, the number of patent applications filed in China was 63,000. In 2010, it was 390,000. So that's an extraordinary difference in the course of one decade. One of the other things that happened with China in 2010 is that it became the country with the largest number of resident patent applications. So if you like, any country receives applications from its own residents and from foreigners. The number of uh, resident patent applications received by each office in the world, if you look, measure all of those, China had the largest number of residents. So in, it's, an, it's, it's one measure, if you like, of domestic innovation. Uh, and it, it, it um, passed Japan to have that position, actually, in 2010. Uh, let me say a word about trademarks, if I may. No, sorry, before I leave patents, I want to make one other point, if I may, and it's, you'll find it in the, in the, um, I hope, yes, you'll find on page two, the second last paragraph, what I'm about to talk about in patent system. With the, all of this demand that we see for patents, there is obviously a, um, a challenge for the patent officers of the world to process the patent applications. So we measure the number of potentially pending patent applications in 2010 as being 5.17 million. 5.17 million patent applications that are not processed or have not been processed. Uh, there has been some slight improvement in that. It was a reduction of 3.3% over the preceding year. 
but it's still an enormous um, you know, uh, number of potentially pending applications, and it's something that raises a major policy question as to how the world should deal with that to make uh, uh, sure that we have an effective and efficient patent system that corresponds to the needs of industry. Uh, on trademarks, let me say a word, if I may. Um, what we saw is a rise of nearly 12%, 11.8% in trademarks in 2010. That's interesting because it seems to us that as a generalisation, trademark statistics, uh, trademark applications bear a much more immediate correspondence to economic conditions than patents do. Uh, much more immediate in time correspondence. Patents, the gap it tends to be a little bit longer, but in the case of trademarks, uh, they are to some extent a leading indicator of what's happening in the economy. So we see uh, a big rebound in pa uh, trademarks, 11.8% growth. Worldwide, 3.66 million trademark applications. Uh, and again, we see China feature extremely pro prominently because China is the largest trademark application. And one extraordinary thing, figure that I can give you about China and trademarks is that the number of trademark applications coming out of China in 2010 rose by a quarter of a million, 250,000. I'm just trying to find where that is mentioned. I think it's yeah. It rose by a number that was more than the total number of uh, annual applications of France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. So it rose by 250,000. It's on the top of page three of the press release for you. Yeah. So again, you see enormous activity occurring on the part of uh, China. Um, and then for industrial designs, let me say that uh, this is an area that is experiencing growth. It's, um, uh, the total number of applications worldwide was 724,000, um, and that's quite a significant number. And designs, of course, are the principal means of product differentiation. Uh, and we see, again, China accounting for 83% of the growth in industrial design applications, the overall growth being at 13%. So perhaps I will stop there. Um, I could add a word, one word, which was, which is, so that's 2010, what's happening in 2011? We don't have the statistics from the national offices yet. Uh, that's the point of this report, why it comes out a little bit later. But in the international systems, we have seen in 2011, for the first nine months, significant growth. So uh, the international patent applications uh, under the Patent Cooperation Treaty in the first nine months of 2011 um, 11 are up uh, in the vicinity of 10%. Uh, and international trademark applications in the first nine months are up in the vicinity of 7%. 7%. Uh, international trademark applications, first nine months of 2011, up in the vicinity of 7%. Yes. So now, uh, you know, what happens with the turbulence in, caused by the sovereign debt crisis is another story. So you have Jean. no indication yet? Well, I think the, ess the essence of the situation is that it's unpredictable. Mm. Uh, you know, and that's, that's, I think, what we're living with. We're not sure what is happening. Why does it take so long to get the figures from the end of the year to get the figures from the year to year? Well, we collect them from every office in the world, and some are more efficient at sending them in than others. Mm. And can you explain why, um, I mean, 
And there's a lot of uh, analysis in this, too. And, yeah. and just uh, to give the readers a sense of the story, yeah. beyond the figures, what's responsible for this rebound? I mean, is, is, is it, uh, China and the U.S. leading the rebound? Well, I think you've got, uh, yeah, yes, you've got several factors, I'd say, uh, behind it. And, Masaid, please, you know, correct me where I'm wrong. Several factors. One is that you have, uh, uh, in the advanced economies, a rate of increase in the investment in intangibles, which is greater than the rate of increase in the investment in intangibles. That's the knowledge economy. Okay, that more investment in intangibles, in intangible assets, and when you have more investment in intangibles, of course, there is more interest in protection of those intangibles, namely intellectual property. So this is one phenomenon that's, that's at play in the longer term. And we see that in, for example, uh, the latest estimate of research and development for 2012 gives an estimate which is positive of a growth of about 5%, for example. What is the why behind that? What is the what? The why behind that? Why is that happening? Yeah. Well, we, the knowledge component in, in production is increasing. Um, you look at the way we live now compared to the way we lived in 1900. We were getting around on horses and, you know, we were not flying in aeroplanes, we didn't have computers, you wouldn't have been sitting there doing that. You know, there, there's, there is, there are so, you know, we are so technologically based that there is a huge investment every, all the time, and, and it shows in the statistics, uh, in the intangible economy. So that's one factor. The second factor, I think, is, is a recognition in national economic policies and strategies that, that uh, this sector of the economy, intangibles or research and development, innovation, is responsible for economic growth. The, a major component of economic growth. Uh, it is responsible for competitivity, you know, your competitive advantage, uh, and it's responsible for the generation of employment also. So, uh, therefore, there is, there is, I think, an additional reason to, to uh, why people seek to protect intellectual property, the fruits of that. And then you do have the phenomenon of China, which has moved to become the second largest investor in absolute terms in research and development in the world. It has overtaken Japan in that position. Uh, and it continues to invest, you know, increase its investment in research and development. Uh, and um, we see that reflected in the figures that I gave you of a decade of growth of 22.6% in patent applications. So I think there are a lot of factors at play. Uh, Dan, and then... Yeah, I just want to be clear on the figures here. Yeah. Um, again, we are talking about applications filed through the national offices. This is exclusive of applications filed through the PCT and the Madrid system? Well, uh, you know, actually what happens in, for some of the applications, for example, PCT applications, is they are first filed in the national uh, office, let's say the US. Then they come, they file an international application, and then after a period, that international application passes into national applications elsewhere. But we only count them once. Okay, all right. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, in regards to the growth of China, do you have any indication whether this um, explosion activity is being driven by um, Chinese companies, or are we talking about foreign investors who are seeking to protect their intellectual property in China? I think it's both. In the case of China, China, I just have a note here. In the case of China and Korea, uh, most of it is driven by um, resident applications, as the domestic applicant are driving the growth. In the case of China, where in the case of U U.S. Uh, PTO, in the U.S. It's driven by both resident and non-resident applicants. Okay, but domestic applicants could include joint ventures, foreign and Chinese joint ventures? You could include that, yes. Can I ask a really quick one? Sure. When you say patents filed, are these patents, are these just pure applications and they can be turned down or are they? Yeah, 
We're yeah. talking about applications. Is that significant but, but, that are accepted? Or yeah, but we do give figures on, on patents granted also. And what we notice is that there's a record number of patents granted also in 2010. So, uh, you know, typically a certain percentage will not get granted of applications, yeah. Monsieur Gorigon de l'UNFPD, une question c'est concernant l'Afrique. Oui. Euh, évidemment, euh, même, même dans le résumé des résumés des résumés, euh, l'Afrique ne figure mm -hmm. presque pas. Mm -hmm. Je me rappelle d'elle avoir eu une bonne discussion à Dakar avec un de vos représentants. La question parfois est, 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 est soulevée. Qu'est-ce qui fait que, pour ne pas créer une polémique inutile, je vous pose la question ouais. très clairement. Ouais. Qu'est-ce qui fait que l'Afrique n'est pas présente dans ce classement, si vous voulez On va poser la question comme ça, mais oui. Et je pense que, euh, tout d'abord, euh, ce qu'on voit en Afrique, c'est une euh, utilisation augmentant des marques. Okay. C'est une, une première euh, euh, utilisation de, du système de la propriété intellectuelle. Et également euh, une utilisation croissante des dessins modernes industriels. En ce qui concerne les brevets, euh, c'est toujours euh, un champ euh, à travailler, un domaine à travailler. Donc, notre premier accent dans ce report est ce qui se passe dans le monde de la technologie. Et euh, c'est pour cette raison qu'on voit figurer plutôt les chiffres concernant les États-Unis, le Japon, les, la Chine, etc. Euh, et il s'agit tout simplement de la capacité technologique des pays africains euh, par rapport euh, euh, pour les, les statistiques, les chiffres concernant les, les demandes de brevets d'invention. Mais, euh, comme j'ai dit, on voit un mouvement euh, dans l'utilisation des marques. Ouais, en fait, souvent, les, 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 en Afrique, les gens, ils disent, ils envoient pour la reconnaissance de, de leurs euh, inventions, mais c'est jamais reconnu, en fait. Qu'est-ce qu qui pose ce, cela comme problème Aujourd'hui, vous, quelle aide apportez-vous, si on peut parler ici, à, au aux gens qui sont dans le folklore, par exemple, ou bien qui sont au fond de la médecine traditionnelle, pour que le travail aussi puisse être... Oui. On a deux euh, euh, approches. Tout d'abord, il y a une négociation en train pour la conclusion d'un instrument nation, international qui va mettre la protection des savoirs, du savoir traditionnel, des, des expressions traditionnelles culturelles du folklore, dans le cadre juridique international pour la propriété intellectuelle. Ça, c'est la première chose. Et cette année, c'est-à-dire 2012, c'est une année extrêmement importante parce que les assemblées, notre euh, réunion annuelle des États membres en septembre, doit prendre une décision de convoquer ou non une conférence diplomatique pour un traité dans ces domaines. Un traité sur le savoir traditionnel, le folklore euh, et les, le, la propriété intellectuelle par rapport aux ressources génétiques. Deuxième chose, on a euh, beaucoup d'activités pour le renforcement de la capacité euh, pour euh, le, euh, la protection du folklore et du savoir traditionnel. À cet égard, les pays de l'Afrique, dites anglophone, si je peux, <rire> À Ripo, on conclut un protocole à leurs accords qui s'appelle le protocole de Swakopmund euh, en Namibie pour la protection du savoir traditionnel dans le pays. Et il y a un tel instrument euh, sous négociation pour les pays dits francophones, euh, euh, c'est-à-dire les pays de l'OAPI. John <laughs> um, yes, coming back to um, trademarks and patents, um, with reference to trademarks, how many of these defensive trademarks, people just registering mm. to prevent life 
life registration. And if you have statistics in the three categories on dispute settlement or uh, cases before the courts, uh, thanks. Uh, we don't know is the answer to both. Uh, so defensive, uh, I mean, it's difficult to say, but I, you know, as a, as a guess, I would not see the nearly one million applications in China as being defensive, you know? And that great growth that you see in China, I don't see it's a growth in defensive. I think it's, it's, it's an first access to the system. Brand development. Yeah, brand development, exactly. And I think there is an increasing consciousness that an important dimension of innovation is organizational and marketing. And therefore, brands, uh, you know, are prized more and more. And I think that's what we're seeing in the statistics rather than defensive protection. Uh, and on the litigation, we don't have, the, unfortunately, the statistics. Yeah. Any indications from the court system uh, where it's going? I mean, there's so many... Headline cases now. Big in the pattern area, and and trading I would say, trademarks. and trademarks, yeah. I'd say, well, I would have thought mainly in the pattern area and in the ICT and telecommunications area, in particular. Um, Ashish, and then. What about the prices for the? It's very difficult to give a general answer to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's each country makes its own policy, it makes its own decision. I can tell you that at the international level, our fees have not changed for, since I think about 1990, uh, well, a long time, anyway. No, yeah, 1990s, late 1990s. But nationally, fees do increase. But but we varies across the offices. Varies, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, from Do you foresee a downturn on the application to the Japanese or so the in the aftermath of What we're seeing in Japan is very interesting. We're seeing a changing pattern of use of the patent system. So in general we see domestic applications going down and international applications going up uh, from Japan. Yeah, that, that is correct. So uh, that's an interesting um, concentration of resources. You know, it's saying what is important here is getting international protection for our enterprises. Protection in... Yeah, that's more important, getting international protection for our good inventions than getting multiple local applications for more at, for more inventions, broadly speaking. Increased by 21 percent in Japan. So, yeah, more saying. So yeah. in Japan, uh, the data we have for 2011 for international system, the growth in application from Japan is 22.8 percent. That's a considerable increase. What are the national? 22.8, and that's in. in Twenty. Domestic was, there was a decrease of one point, uh, I just have to check, I think it was 1.1% uh, domestic yeah. in Japan. And that's very interesting because, as you know, it's been a tragic year for Japan. But we see international patent applications increasing by over 20%. So it's a very... Change has nothing to do with earthquake. Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, well... Yes and no. Uh, uh, it's the change is a change in behaviour of patenting, from more emphasis on international for protection. Now, why? Um, I, it's part of their, their strategy, uh, you know, of, of, of Japanese enterprises to emphasise the international protection. I think. Please, and then Richard. <coughs> Well, you know, it's very difficult 
question because you see the um, the increase in uh, investment in research and development in China is very strong. And you would say that a consequence of that is going to be a continued increase in patent applications. Um, and it's not just in research and development. There's uh, it's increase in investment in education. And increasingly also, <clears throat> the capacity has improved as a consequence of past investment. <clears throat> so I think um, one might expect a continuation of the trend, but you would not expect that that trend would continue at the same high rates of growth, certainly not forever. Well, uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, in the sense that it's difficult to predict what's going to happen, but the trend has been uh, strong growth in China. But whether that's sustainable in the long run, we just don't know for that one. But uh, apart from R&D investment, uh, research and development investment, but also the GDP uh, grew quite strongly in uh, China. So all those factors come into play. Um, the absolute figures that you give in your press release and in the report, are they always for the patent offices in the different countries or do they accumulate also the international applications? Well, they're just uh, two different, they're for the national, each national uh, office. Um, and then we have a separate set of statistics, if you like, about the international systems. <coughs> Now we only count once in the we only count we don't double count the international, yeah. but w so why do we do the the um, statistics separately for the international? Uh, well, for several reasons besides our own business interests of of you know seeing how the systems are performing and how attractive they are, but uh, what the, a rough assumption would be that what goes through the international system is the more valuable investment or brand. It's a rough assumption that if you are going to seek protection beyond your own, own market, then you must have a belief at any rate that it is a valuable invention. So you would say that roughly that what's coming through the international patent system is uh, are the strongest inventions. Uh, and, uh, of course, you're not going to know that n until afterwards, but that's the rough assumption. And therefore, it's interesting to know, you know, who is, who, where those are coming from and in what fields of technology they are and also where, where they are targeting. So US enterprises are patenting in what other countries? That tells you something, you know, or Japanese enterprises are patenting in one other country. Chinese enterprises are patenting in one other country. These, these tell us something about patterns of trade and technological investment. And if I, if I um, make a patent, an international one, do I say for which countries it is valid? Or is it <laughs> Ultimately, you do. You don't at the time of the application, but you do uh, when you have to... There is a time limit for entering the national phase or the national procedure. Mm -hmm. So you have to but at that stage. But the absolute figures that are here, the international applications are in or not? They're included, yeah. But they they're, they're you know, the, the, number of to the total number of patent applications worldwide is 1.98 million. The total number of international patent applications is about 170,000. For one year? For one year. 170,000 so, yeah. last year? Yeah. Uh, 2011 we expect. Uh, 2011, we expect by last year it was 164, roughly. I, I mean, yeah. I can give you the figure later on. It was around about 164,000, yes. But we're expecting this year about 170 plus. Yeah. plus. Yeah. But can you say something about the tendency? Is the tendency growing that people want international applications? Yes. So the tendency is that that growth in, in um, you might say that growth in uh, patent applications worldwide is being driven by, first, the knowledge economy, the increased investment in knowledge, and secondly, by globalization. That is, seeking protection in a broader set of geographical markets. Thank you. Uh, Boris? 
Yes, Loris Engelson, a local freelancer. You spoke a lot on the national breakdown of patents and uh, the, let's say, the quantitative uh, trends. Would you have any comment on the tables, page 65 through 67, for instance, or the kind of tables, page 157, 170, and, and, and on my favorite, which is page 78, and its concrete application 79. Yeah. And then I have a second. Yeah. <laughs> you want to go ahead? Well, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Of course. What I, what I would say about 65 is, as I think we've discussed, it's a very, a, a very good graphic representation of changing the changing geography of technology production. Okay. 67. That's the PRO's government channel. That that's that's state state sponsored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so um, yeah, it's but you've got in there ROK, Singapore, Japan, I am reading to Spain. France. Who we can with you from <laughs> <laughs> France, does that excludes uh, the defence R and D, right? Uh, this one basically gives you the biggest, I mean, if you look at the no, top of... It depends, r and If I'm a, a U.S. corporation and I do public, uh, I do my own R&D and then I get a Department of Defense classified project and I well, that, well, it, that it, it includes it includes all defense except where it's classified, I think is the answer sure. to that. Well, what's classified? The fact that they're doing research or what no, they're doing? The, the contract mm. and what they're doing yeah. is, not, is, is not. It is, does not get into the, yeah. And in the US, it's under the billions. How much, sir? On the relative, spe uh, 79, um, uh, Mosaid, it's your yeah. index. Yeah. Okay, I mean, this one basically, it breaks down the patent by, we go into a bit more details to see what is happening at the different technological fields. So we break the data by technological field, and then we compare the country's share with relative to other countries uh, to the total patent as well. And that gives you an indication of yeah, where, where this is. This is one of the most uh, inspiring pages. Yeah, so it's very interesting. And a lot of the stuff we know expected, for example, if you look at the pharmaceutical, you have India, Belgium, Swiss is on the top, you know, have a strong activity in that area. Which Similar, page is the pharmaceutical? Page 79. 79? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same thing with the ICT, Finland, Nordic countries, Finland and Sweden, they have a strong uh, innovative activity in the ICT field. And that is, show, you know, visually is present in that information. And you don't have a, you have here the business sector, um, you don't have a list of the, of the pharmaceutical, like 60, 65. Uh, no, we don't have the list for that one. The business sector is the top applicant for the international applications, so we have the list of that. But we don't classify that and what they belong to, but in theory, mm -hmm. we should be able to get some data on that one. Yes. But we don't present that. We don't present that. Because the no numbers are quite, I mean, if you look at the numbers of applicants, I mean, for example, the first one is Panasonic, and we are looking at 2,000 applications. If you further go down. Page 77. Uh, but you, if you look through the list, you'll get a few. You'll get a few on the list. Um, you know what's interesting in that list too, uh, if you turn over to page 66, uh, is the university applicants. Do we have... Uh, country PCT. Yeah. I think I've said to you before, but if you if you take page sixty six and you take the University of California, three hundred and four, and you treated it as a country, it would come about nineteenth in the list of countries filing international patent applications, about nineteenth. 
that is, it files more international patent applications than about 120 countries. And, and it's a university. So this, the movement in universities is a very interesting thing. You see them coming into this field increasingly. Yeah, but they, they're coming. You wait and see. <laughs> are we are we good? Uh, I, One, go ahead, two last questions. Yeah. Uh, as has been already discussed, I think, during this press conference, the relation between creativity and yeah. patents yeah. has changed over history. Yeah. The meaning of patent as a symbol of industrial progress and revolution in the 1850s, probably not the same as etc. So when China comes in, yeah. does it also induce a revolution, not only in numbers, but in attitudes, in uh, precisely the balance between defensive, offensive, the, the uh, purely legal expertise vis-a-vis -vis technical expertise, etc. Could you comment on the mm. qualitative impact of the... We can't really. I, we, could, we can speculate, but we can't comment, you know, uh, with, uh, with proper analysis because uh, you would need to do a very rigorous study of it. Uh, you hear lots of different anecdotes about Chinese patenting, but, you know, that with these numbers, the quality is not so good and so on. But there's no measure of that. This is not... I would not... Um, place any reliance whatsoever on those anecdotes. Um, if they're investing, you know, um, roughly two hundred billion dollars in research and development every year, I would not be game to say that this is producing low quality patents. You know, uh, so I think we don't know the answer to that really. But but it's a very interesting question to to watch. Yeah. Yeah, to, to follow on Boris's question, <clears throat> you remember in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you had the, the big dispute between the US and the Japanese on yeah. uh, that the Americans were claiming the Japanese were stalling on the registration of the, of the applications and were doing it domestically by stalling uh, on the registration. Are we seeing something like that in, in China, that the process is... Yeah. is I, 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 there's no evidence of that. There's no evidence of that. But the, the fact, I, I would say the point is this, from, and obviously we're speaking in our own interests here as a multilateral organisation, but the more investment you get in research and development and in intangibles generally and in the knowledge economy more generally, the more valuable your title of protection of intellectual property becomes for competitive positioning, both on the individual, the industrial, and the country level. And as that happens, the more important it is to have an impartial arbiter. And, and therefore, the more important become the international procedures for obtaining protection and the fairness and, in, and transparency of those procedures. Mr. Prison. I have to go back again to China. Um, it seems that the, these huge growth figures we're seeing here, um, one could argue, is uh, an endorsement of China's intellectual property system. One could argue also you know, enforcement as well. And we have countries like the US with the USTR issuing annual reports condemning China's protection of intellectual property rights, talking about still massive piracy and counterfeiting. So I was wondering what, what you would see this as um, an endorsement of great improvements in China's system, these new figures, or? I think that what, what the figures show is the endorsement of China of intellectual property as an instrument of economic policy. Uh, they clearly are investing in it, and they're clearly using it. Uh, now, if you want to say that there is some part of their system is not functioning as well as you know you, you, uh, someone would like it to, for example, the enforcement part, that's a different question. But 
here what we are seeing is an extraordinary investment in the use of the system. So they clearly consider the system to be an important instrument of public of economic policy, I would say. That's the Chinese. That's the Chinese. And the more that they are uh, in, in investing in the system and the more applications that they're farming, then I think you would say the more they will uh, support the system. And um, they clearly see advantages in it. OK. Maybe that's one. You still face two big challenges ahead. One is to write that book on the anecdotes on intellectual property you would never believe, but that will be for you after your retirement. And <laughs> until then, you probably have as a main task to make sure that the patent system and intellectual property remains at the service of technological and scientific Absolutely. problems. Do you see any issue currently which worries you in that sense and which you hope to correct in the coming one, two or five years? Well, I'd see the first issue is, is management of demand. So the 5.17 million un potentially unprocessed patent applications, this is a threat to the efficiency of the system. You know, clearly industry's interests and the interests of innovation, I would suggest more generally, are not being served by a patent system which is clogged up. So that's one big challenge, I think. It's a mechanical challenge, okay? Um, I'd say the second big challenge is, is a policy challenge that as you get more investment in knowledge production and as knowledge is, becomes more important in every single form of economic production, including health, environmentally sensitive technologies, agricultural technologies and so on, as that happens, naturally you get greater tension around Social, uh, social tension around the intellectual property right. I think that's a natural phenomenon because you get a collision of public policies. You know, the health policy is give access to health care to as many as possible, essentially, you know, crudely putting it. The innovation policy is create scarcity, you know, in order to encourage investment in innovation. So. So this, I, I don't think we should be worried about this. I think this is normal. It's, it's, it's an inevitable phenomenon of the knowledge economy. But we need to manage the tensions that arise, the policy tensions that arise. And then I think the third thing is that uh, we have as an international system a re reasonably well-developed legislative system internationally. But there is no development of, for ex internationally, of the, quote, enforcement system, if you like. Uh, and we're not alone in that regard. You know, just about every interna the international community is, is not good at enforcement. Because for the obvious reason that countries don't like others snooping around what they're doing. So this is a challenge. How can you hold together an international system in a closely integrated global economy dealing only with the creation of rights and not with their arbitration, as it were, you know, with their... Uh, so, but that's a terribly difficult policy question, obviously, on which the international community is not doing terribly well at the moment, you know, in all fields. I think we have one last question. Um, yeah, I'd just like to come back to Dan's question, Francis, about um, uh, Chinese um, alleged um, piracy, etc. Um, what uh, what is your view on that? Uh, what's the is what is the extent of it, and uh, how can that be uh, tackled under the system as it exists? Well, <coughs> first, I think we have a measurement problem. You know that we don't have uh, precise uh, statistics on this, uh, so that's the first thing that, that 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 we need to notice. I think the second thing is that. Um, well, it's a vast country, and it's a country with differential levels of, invest of, of development. 
uh, and the eastern seaboard is obviously at a different stage of development from some of the other uh, provinces and internal provinces and the western provinces of, of the country. And whenever you have uneven development, you have uneven application of, of uh, policies. This is inevitability. So uh, I think that, that uh, what we can say at this stage is the Chinese take-up of intellectual property is extraordinary, you know. And um, the Premier, the Prime Minister of China, has said, Mr Wen Jiabao, that intellectual property will be the basis of competition in the future. So they have clearly a strategic view of this. And what I think we will see is an increasing, you know, embracing of the whole of intellectual property and that will have positive consequences on their enforcement. Thank you so much and Merry Great. Christmas. Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you.